Uh, welcome to the third uh, Hot Electronic Seminar Talk, and I'll be the host today, tonight, uh, this morning, this afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, well, I hope you, you made it. I understand there's a little bit of confusion between Europe and the uh, Eastern time zone, since the Eastern time zone is already in daylight saving or something like that. So. I hope you made it. If you didn't make it, uh, I'm sorry. Um, that's one of the reasons to join our mailing list since uh, we remind you about this meeting there and about the possible confusion of the time zone. So if you'd like to join the mailing list, it's totally free. Um, you can do it on the website. On the website as well, you can find the recordings from the previous uh, hottest. So. Uh, both uh, Emily's and Peter's talks are available there. Uh, in addition, um, you uh, yeah you can see the uh, the slides if you don't want to listen to people, just want to see their slides. So uh, without further delay, I'm gonna say that the plan for today is that we're gonna listen to Carlos talk, and that's gonna take one hour. After that, we're gonna thank Carlo, and. After we thank Carlo, um, we're gonna have 30 minutes for discussion. And after this discussion, we're gonna end and we're gonna meet again in two weeks for Ulrich's talk. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say. Uh, actually, that's more than I had to say, but uh, so sorry for subjecting you to that. Um, but other than that, I guess it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carlo and Julie, who will speak about computational semantics of Cartesian cubical type theory. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, by the way, I have the chat open uh, on another monitor. So if you type in questions there, I may or may not notice them. But uh, feel free to interrupt me um, in the middle. Can, can you see my mouse? Like, I'm waving the mouse around? No? I can't. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm trying my best, but still. Okay. Nothing. Cool. Good. Uh, good to know. Okay. So I'll try not to point at things with my mouse, although I certainly will. Uh, okay. Hi, Torsten. All right. Uh, okay. So, so suppose that I want to define a new type theory for reasoning about some cool kind of thing like uh, homotopy types or infinity categories or you know cohesive spaces or even things like programs that don't terminate or you know any anything like that um, there is a question of what rules should I include in that type theory and the obvious uh, the obvious answer is just you check what holds in the model that you have in mind and then you just write down whatever rules uh, are validated in that model but that's not quite right, I think, because um, you know we we normally expect there to be uh, certain properties of the rules, and uh, and also the rules are made out of syntax, and your syntax won't contain every single thing that the the model does. So in the hot book, for example, um, we have a unit type, but we uh, don't include the rule that says every element of the unit type is judgmentally equal to the uh, distinguished element. Right, that's the uh, eta rule here, and I'm already pointing at things. Okay, uh, and then uh, the we have a uh, interval higher inductive type, and we say that on um, the point constructors, this is the middle rule here. On the point constructors, uh, it computes judgmentally, um, but on the path constructors, it does not. Uh, that's the we have the second rule, and we don't have the third rule, um, and. You know, the choice of what rules you have or don't have really affects what things are provable. For example, if you have the second rule and the analogous one for the right endpoint, then you can prove function extensionality uh, from just the interval. You don't need uh, univalence. Uh, but if you don't have this rule, then you can't prove it that way. So it really does affect what things are provable. And in particular, there, there are all sorts of properties we might uh, want or expect, like we might want uh, terms to have unique types, we might want the judgments to be decidable. I'm especially interested in uh, the other properties, though, that uh, are 
sort of uh, typical of so-called constructive theories, the existence property and the canonicity property. Existence says that uh, basically if you prove that there exists a number such that something, then there's actually a numeral that satisfies that predicate. And uh, canonicity says that if you have a closed uh, element of the Boolean type, then it computes to either true or false. And all of these uh, questions I've uh, written down here are, are really about the rules and the syntax of the type theory. They're not questions you can answer just by looking at you know, some mathematical model. And in practice, uh, verifying any of these properties requires constructing some sort of model of the rules in which you can regard the proofs as computations of some sort. And so that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, these properties are actually important in practice. Uh, so my favorite example is that uh, um, at the uh, IES, uh, Guillaume showed that uh, pi 4 of S3 is uh, Z mod some number, uh, but wasn't able to actually figure out what that number was. Uh, and uh, he developed much, much more math in his PhD thesis uh, that eventually was able to actually compute that this number is 2. Now, if the uh, type theory satisfied the canonicity property, then the, the K from before would just compute to 2. Or if you had a computational semantics for the theory, then K should just evaluate to 2 as a program. All right. So basically, the goal of my talk is uh, to hopefully convince you that when you're designing a type theory, you should consider its computational semantics as uh, they're one of the things that you would uh, like to have for really for everything to be uh, nice and in order. Um, so first I'm going to explain how the computational semantics work for normal martin lift type theory. And then I'm going to explain what Cartesian cubicle type theory is and uh, what its computational semantics are. And it's uh, the, the second point here that is uh, my work. OK, so computational semantics. Um, uh, I want to start by pointing out that canonicity is only going to ever hold for closed terms. Uh, if you're in a non-empty context, there are all sorts of uh, Booleans that aren't equal to either true or false, um, you know, ranging from just using a Boolean in the context to more complicated things. And in fact, uh, you can construct models that characterize what the neutral open terms are. That's uh, given any context, sort of what are the most reduced um, open terms of Boolean type or of any type in that context. And you can do that using a generalization of the tools I'm going to discuss today. But today, I'm just going to really talk about the closed term properties like uh, canonicity and existence. So the, the basic idea is that you build a model in which the closed terms uh, can be regarded as programs. And then you, uh, so you define a programming language and an operational semantics. And then at every type, you define some notion of equality. And uh, finally, you check that uh, uh, everything you've defined is compatible with all of the rules that uh, you wrote down in the first place. So you start by uh, defining a syntax of preterms. These are untyped terms, and they're considered only modulo alpha equivalents, so not beta or eta or anything like that. And uh, this includes um, the terms that you expect to be here. Uh, but it also includes the things that you might have called types instead. Uh, these are also part of the or term syntax. And uh, that's because we don't know what the types are yet. I haven't gotten around to defining what types are. And to define what the types are, you have to know when two terms are equal. And I haven't gotten there yet either. So this is really just kind of the raw syntax of the, uh, of the theory. Uh, and then we're going to say that every closed term computes to a value. So we define an operational semantics that, uh, that says uh, which closed terms are values. These are ones that don't uh, reduce any further. Uh, there is a relation that says that one term steps to another term. And then you can define sort of the transitive closure of the uh, stepping relation that's written down arrow. That, that just means that uh, some term fully evaluates all the way down to a value, uh, some v. All right, so these rules are, uh, I think, basically what you'd expect. Maybe it's worth noting that these are sort of uh, lazy, or you you know you don't compute under binders. 
And you also, uh, you don't compute the argument to a function, you only compute the function position and uh, things like that. All right, so I can actually already uh, tell you the meaning of the Booleans in this model. And uh, the, the principle here is that the meanings of non-values are determined by the values of those terms. So uh, M is an element of the Boolean type in this model if M evaluates to true or to false, given the evaluation semantics that I defined on the previous slide. And then uh, you say that two Booleans are equal if they both evaluate to true or they both evaluate to false. All right, now, the first observation is that the, the first line is kind of redundant. Uh, you can recover what it means to be in bool by just saying that uh, m is in bool if m is equal to m in bool. That's exactly the same thing. But in fact, uh, at every type, this will end up being the case. The second thing is that uh, the elements of this type are defined uh, by means of an evaluation closure of some relation on values. So if I write a uh, brackets bool for the relation on values, it relates true to true and false to false. And then M is equal to N in bool exactly when, if you evaluate both M and N, they land in the relation bool. So I'm going to write a sort of a superscript down arrow for that. All right, uh, so this is what's called a partial equivalence relation. It's a symmetric and transitive relation. And these just come in handy a lot for defining this sort of semantics. It's a very uh, useful trick and it saves you uh, duplicating some definitions. Uh, this is the same as just saying uh, the Booleans are a subset of the values equipped with some sort of equivalence relation. So the things in the subset are the things that are related to themselves in the relation. And then uh, if something is related to itself, then among those things, uh, the partial equivalence relation is actually a total equivalence relation. So you could ask, well, if I'm modeling every type just as a quotiented subset of the values, why don't I just take the quotient and just say the types are sets instead of partial equivalence relations? Well, the reason is that I don't actually want to take this quotient because I want to be able to prove things uh, about the very specific shapes of terms, and I, I don't want to pass to equivalence classes. And uh, when you look at the rules of type theory, uh, these, these are defined for very specific pieces of syntax, not for equivalence classes. So I don't want to quotient things, but if you just like math and uh, you don't really care too much about the syntax, whenever I say partial equivalence relation, you can kind of hear set and that's fine. <clears throat> so uh, that's how you uh, define the meanings of non-values. What about open terms? The meanings of open terms are determined by their behavior as maps from closed terms to closed terms. So what I mean by that is, if you have a lambda expression, then you can regard that by substitution as mapping closed arguments to closed results. So uh, at function types, these are non-dependent functions uh, for starters, uh, if you have two partial equivalence relations A and B, then you can define the uh, function space between those and uh, that consists of lambdas such that when you regard those as functions uh, from terms to terms, they are actually functions from the partial equivalence relation A to the partial equivalence relation B. So what that means is if you take two equal things in A, uh, these two functions send them to equal things in B. And uh, yeah, and I regard uh, what are functions? Uh, mathematical functions? Yeah, so uh, you say are uh, equal as functions. So that means functions in the meta theory or what? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So what's your meta theory? Okay, so I'm, I'm doing this basically in any constructive set theory, or you can even do it inside something like Hawk. Um, uh, so it's, it's not very specific, but uh, you know, some sort of set theory or type theory. Um, okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll touch on that uh, very briefly later. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I want to emphasize here a couple things. First of all, the meaning of A or B depends entirely on the meanings of A and B. Uh, and also that um, 
yeah, that I'm really that this is a semantic condition, as Thorson was pointing out. I'm I'm uh, this isn't just a matter of saying oh n1 and n2 look exactly the same. It's saying that their extension as functions, as mathematical functions, are are the same. Okay. So type theory is uh, often presented with these five judgments of uh, you know, what is a context, and in any context, what is a type, what are equal types, uh, what is an element, and what are equal elements. Uh, in the computational semantics I'm talking about, you reduce open judgments to closed judgments by regarding open terms as maps. Uh, you reduce membership judgments to equality judgments by saying, you know, M is in A if M is equal to M in A. So really, the only thing you have to explain, uh, well, you have to make precise the things I just said, but the only things you really have to uh, directly define are uh, what does it mean for two types to be equal in an empty context, and what does it mean for two terms of a type to be equal in an empty context. Um, and furthermore, because uh, the judgments on non-values are defined in terms of the judgments on values, you actually only have to explain this uh, where all of these things appear are values. So you don't have to uh, understand this entire definition, but basically uh, the semantics consists of a relation like this, uh, who, tau, whose first argument, or whose first and second arguments are uh, canonical expressions that represent types that are equal, and uh, the uh, equality relation of both of those types is this phi. So tau a0, b0, phi means uh, a0 and b0 are equal uh, types, and um, the equality relation is phi. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this relation has to be functional, symmetric, transitive, and per-valued. And uh, the reason, uh, maybe now is a good time to point out, the reason that I'm writing it uh, like this, valero, valero, blah, 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 is that you can actually uh, define the type system that we're interested in uh, as an inductive definition inside of Koch. Uh, in the uh, New Perl and Koch project, they sort of did this for the entire New Perl system. Um, and you can also define it uh, if you just want to use some more traditional set theory, uh, you can define it using uh, some sort of least fixed point argument. And that's, that's what I actually do. Okay, so relative to any one of these semantics, you can define what all these judgments mean. Uh, so A equals B type, when if you evaluate A and you evaluate B, they're related by tau, uh, and they're related to some relation. And uh, I'll notate this relation, the, uh, the meaning of A, or equivalently, the meaning of B. And then uh, M equals N in A, uh, means that in the relation assigned to A, M and N are equal if you evaluate them. And of course, this doesn't make any sense unless you already know that A is a type, because otherwise, what is the uh, equality relation on A? That, that's not defined. So uh, that's why we require that A is a type in order to make sense of the statement M equals N and A. All right. Finally, you can define the open judgments by induction on the length of the context. It gets a little hairy, so I'll just do the uh, length one context here. It says that, uh, well, to be equal types in some context means that whenever you uh, take two equal elements of the context, then the substitution instances are equal. So this says you can regard B and C as maps, and they are, uh, they are maps out of A into the collection of types that respect uh, equality in A. Uh, and then the uh, definition of uh, equal um, terms in a type is, is very similar. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, here I say that uh, these two terms have to be equal in B of M, and uh, B of M is the same as B of M prime because we assume that B uh, is a map out of A that respects equality, so uh, that all makes sense. All right, uh, so now we can actually go ahead and define tau. Um, so for a normal Martin Left type theory, it would go something like this. Uh, you know, a bool is a type, and its uh, membership relation is just true or false. Right? Uh, for pi types, uh, if the domains are equal and the codomains are equal as uh, type families, then the elements are just lambdas that are, uh, that are maps from A to B in the appropriate sense. 
And then you can also define uh, sigma and, and identity in, uh, in a similar way. You don't have to read all of this, but the, uh, the, uh, maybe the point being that if you look at the meaning of the identity type, it, it just says, well, um, there's an identity proof of m equals n exactly when m equals n. All right, so that's the definition of the semantics, but you want to actually prove that um, that it models all of the rules that you uh, that you might have written down. So you prove a soundness theorem that says, okay, if I can derive that a uh, that a equals b type, then in the semantics uh, a equals b type, and if I can derive that m equals n and a, then in the semantics m equals n and a. And uh, notice here that I'm using different notation for the sort of uh, rules of type theory as from the semantics, just to make things um, clearer. So to prove this, you basically just have to check every single rule. And this is long and tedious, but uh, if you didn't check every rule, then you could uh, easily have something that's not actually a model. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, once you've uh, established soundness, all these uh, nice properties like canonicity are essentially automatic. Uh, so uh, if you have a uh, closed term of type bool in the rules, then m evaluates to true or false. And the reason is, well, if the rules prove that m is in bool, then in the model, m is in bool. And what that means is that m evaluates to something in the per for bool, and the only things in the per for bool are true and false, so we're done. Uh, you also get consistency automatically. So I didn't define uh, the empty type, but imagine that you know the empty type is uh, modeled by the empty partial equivalence relation. So it's not possible to derive in an empty context that uh, you have an element of void. Well, why? Well, if you did, then you would have an element of void in the semantics, which means that M evaluates to something in the per for void, but the per for void is empty, so this is impossible. All right, so this is what's known as a logical relations model of, of types, if you've heard that term before. Um, and it's, it's fully constructive, and it also um, ties directly the idea of uh, the type theory to uh, some programming language. So this is a model where if you quotient everything, every type is uh, uh, interpreted as a set of values. This is a set of actual syntax. But the, the syntax is considered modulo uh, semantic equality, as, as Torsten was saying. So it's, this is what I like about it. It's kind of uh, simultaneously very syntactic and very semantic. I mean, you, uh, you, because you're dealing directly with terms, you get to prove uh, very syntactic properties like canonicity, while at the same time you actually have things like function extensionality in this model. So depending on what you're trying to do, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do, um, uh, this might actually be the intended model of your type theory. So for example, if you're doing program extraction in Coq, then you can um, erase all uses of J because at runtime, they will, uh, they will not do anything. And this is made precise in the, in the uh, logical relations semantics where um, Indeed, for any closed term, which is the only thing they're running in extraction, um, the, the only proofs of, uh, of identity are reflexive. Uh, so you're asking what this has to do with realizability? Um, Can I, uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, it reminds me very much on realizability semantics, like omega sets and so on. Maybe can you comment comment on this? What's the relation is? Yeah, I mean, I I think it is a kind of realizability semantics. Um, I'm when I try to look at that literature, I'm I'm a little bit puzzled because because somehow what I think is uh, significant about this is that it's a very um, it's a very kind of manual model that talks very specifically about some specific syntax and oftentimes realizability or categorical realizability is concerned with abstracting away the actual programming language that's being used. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, just for example, in my own uh, history, 
in my in my PhD long long ago. I actually used the realizability semantics, which used lambda terms, which are called lambda sets, to prove strong normalization of calculus of constructions. And it's similar in the sense that I also use sort of the terms of the calculus again as realizers. Okay. So, then yeah, then I think uh, yeah, in that case, it's it's very similar. It, it just seems to me that oftentimes realizability is concerned about a sort of non-specific uh, mm -hmm. notion of computation where you abstract yeah. over, you know, what, what the language yeah. is. And yeah, so everybody, I want to say, yeah? Nobody, no, no, nobody should really need my PhD now, please, because it's lots of rubbish. Okay, well, uh, okay. So then just uh, read my paper instead, I guess. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, uh, right. Okay, uh, but it, it's also worth pointing out that um, for better or for worse, this is definitely not the initial model of the rules that you probably wrote down. Uh, so here are some uh, cool facts that are true in this uh, semantics. So for example, you have uh, eta principles at every type. So um, uh, whenever you have an element of the, uh, of the unit type, it's equal to the distinguished element. But you also have eta for void. So uh, Whenever uh, you're mapping out of the empty type, everything is true. So for example, even true equals false in bool. And that's just because, well, there are no maps out of, uh, out of the empty type, so it's vacuous. Um, you also get um, uh, equality reflection because, again, the, the uh, identity type is being modeled as uh, just uh, equalities. And finally, you also get some untyped, uh, untyped principles, like you say that if M evaluates to true, no matter what M looks like, then M is an element of bool. Uh, you know, M can be any garbage as long as it evaluates to true. All right, and this is just due to the, uh, the nature of the model. You, you don't have to accept all of these things in the rules you write down. Um, in fact, I guess I would advocate you know, you, you definitely want eta for unit. You might not want the last thing if you only want to consider, um, you know, sort of well-typed terms, but that's fine. This is just, uh, this is just a model. All right, so suppose for the sake of argument, though, that we wanted to extend the syntax with some weird sort of rule, like uh, some rule that says, uh, whenever you have two types, then there is a identity proof in the universe between A times B and B times A. Right. Well, the, the reason that the identity type works in the model I just presented is that every closed element of the identity type is REFL. And that's uh, what justifies the uh, elimination principle that says you only have to check REFL. So the computational justification completely breaks. And uh, relative to that kind of model, I mean, this rule just makes no sense. It's, uh, it, that's, this rule is just completely ridiculous. Um, so, so that's all. Uh, no, no. Okay, so um, you can make sense of that kind of rule, but you, you have to change the model significantly. So, so now I'm going to talk about cubicle type theory, but this is a good point if anybody has questions about uh, what I just talked about. All right, well, I'll, I'll just uh, start moving on. Um, okay, so if you want to make sense of a notion of identity type that is not just equality, uh, then you need to equip every type with some additional structure. So if you want the identity type to mean paths in A, then you need to equip A with some sort of path structure and a composition structure on those paths. And then uh, you can define the uh, identity type of A in terms of the, that path structure, and you can de define J in terms of that composition structure. So again, this is the idea that, uh, uh, that every type has to be defined in terms of the, its constituent types. So you can't really think, uh, tr think of the identity type of A as something unrelated to A that you can just uh, postulate has a bunch of elements. It really has to be defined in terms of A. So the, uh, the first uh, kind of attempt at, at this problem was um, this paper, Canonicity for Two-Dimensional Type Theory. And the idea there is, right, you can, uh, you can model a one-groupoid kind of type theory if you just stick in a judgment for uh, what a path of A is. So A as a type means that A is modeled by one groupoid. 
M is an A means that M is an object of that one groupoid. And you have a new judgment that says P is a morphism between M and N in the meaning of A. All right. And you just directly axiomatize all the groupoid structure uh, on this path judgment. So you say, whenever I have an object, I have a reflexive morphism. When I have a, whenever I have a morphism, I have a morphism going the other way, et cetera, et cetera. You write down a lot of rules. Um, but you just you write down everything that has to be true about a one groupoid, and then uh, and then you can do sort of a groupoid version of uh, logical relations, and and uh, you can get canonicity that way. The problem is if you want something higher than one groupoids, even if you just want two groupoids, this quickly spirals out of control. Uh, there are a lot more rules you have to write down, and it's not obvious that you could ever possibly do this for infinity groupoids. Um, so you need to do something else. And really, the, the critical idea um, by uh, BCH in this uh, paper, a model of type theory and cubicle sets, is that cubicle sets uh, are a nice way of, uh, of presenting the structure in type theory. So they present a constructive cubicle set model of, uh, of part of, um, uh, of uh, type theory. And uh, they equip all these cubicle sets with something called the uniform con condition. Right? And, uh, and this work, it's not syntactic, but it's uh, the direct inspiration of both the uh, CCHM cubicle type theory paper and also uh, uh, my work right now that I'm uh, describing. And so people often ask, why cubes? Why not simplices or, or globes or something else? And maybe someone in the audience can give a better answer than I can, but uh, here's my answer. Right? So, so type theory is or about maps from products of things into things. Um, so the basic idea is we're, we're going to want to represent n cubes of A as maps from the representable n cube into A. All right, so this will let us uh, describe the path space as just a dimension shift. So the, uh, the zero cubes of the path space are just the one cubes of A. But this, uh, this has to work uniformly in any other context. So suppose that we're asking instead about the n cubes of the path space. Well, then uh, you have the product of uh, the n cube and the one cube in the context here. But of course, that's just the n plus one cube. So the reason that this works nicely is that uh, the representable cubes are closed under products, whereas the representable simplices are not. So if you, uh, if you do a dimension shift like this, uh, the, the n simplices of this path, spa uh, path space are not just the n plus 1 simplices of the, of the underlying uh, type. They're, they're something a little different. And uh, that doesn't work as well. All right, so the general idea here is that uh, we'll represent, say, a square as a term that's parametrized by two um, variables that range over this interval. So uh, if uh, m depends on x and y, then you can kind of think of it as uh, tracing out some square. And if you just weaken it by um, depending degenerately on some z, then uh, that will uh, be a cube. Right? You can also instantiate x or y at 0 or 1. So for example, if you take m, where you set x to 0, then that's kind of like the left side of this cube, uh, of this square that I've drawn here. Um, the top side is m0 for y. And the fact that the top of the left and the left of the top are the same is just the fact that these two substitutions commute. So that's very nice. It uh, sort of behaves like the syntax does. Uh, so you can take degeneracies and faces. You can also take diagonals. Uh, by substituting x for y. So if you substitute x for y, then, uh, uh, then m only depends on one thing, but the left of that is m with 0 for x and 0 for y, and the right is m with 1 for x and 1 for y, because x and y are not the same. All right, uh, in the CCHM paper, they actually consider much more structure than this on the cubes. They have a full De Morgan algebra that also has connections and reversals. Um, but I only have 
faces degeneracies and diagonals, uh, as well as permutations. And what that just means is if you depend on both x and y, that's the same as depending on y and x, that the, the order doesn't matter. So uh, the uh, cube category that you get out is just the free finite product category on an interval that has two um, elements. And this is why we call it a Cartesian cubicle type theory, because this is a Cartesian sort of notion of cube. Okay, so uh, how does Cartesian cubicle computational type theory work? So you start by defining, of course, a cubicle programming language. So um, an example of how this works is that um, in the circle, you want there be, to be a loop. You want this to be a line from base to base. So uh, you have a loop term that's parameterized by a dimension variable, loop x, and you have a base. And those are both values. You can't reduce loop x any further. But if you take the left endpoint of loop x, if you take loop x with 0 for x, then you get loop 0. And you want loop 0 to be base because you want the left endpoint of loop x to be base. So you just say that loop 0 steps to base. And similarly, you say loop 1 steps to base. All right. So you use this uh, sort of thing to build a model in which the closed terms are regarded as programs. Uh, so you, as I said, define a cubicle programming language. And then you interpret types not as sets, uh, but as Cartesian cubicle sets of values, sort of. Uh, I'll uh, correct this statement in a moment. Uh, but there's a subtle point here of what I mean by closed terms. So you can't consider terms that are fully closed, that is closed both under term variables and dimension variables. Because if you consider only the instances of dimension variables, then that's like saying uh, two lines are the same whenever they have the same faces. And that's not right. Because, uh, for example, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the loop and uh, the reflexive path on the base point, because they have the same endpoints base and base. Uh, so you have to consider terms that are closed on term variables, but open on dimension variables. And that's where a lot of the uh, complication comes in. So basically, for every dimension context, which is just a, a set of uh, dimension variables, uh, the meaning of a type is given by a partial equivalence relation of the values at that dimension. So if the dimension context is x and y, then you have a per of the two-dimensional values that depend on x and y. So for the circle, at every dimension, you say that base is related to itself. And at every dimension that's not dimension 0, you say that uh, the loop is related to itself. And then you also have to throw in compositions and inverses, and I'll get to that later. Then uh, I said that this was a cubicle set. So this is the object part of the functor. And the action is defined by substitution, uh, dimension substitution followed by evaluation. And uh, why is that? Well, if you take the uh, loop sub x and you apply a face map to it, what you get out is not a value. So it's certainly not in these uh, partial equivalence relations of values. So you have to evaluate it. So the action of the face map on loop is to do a substitution. And then if you evaluate it, you get the base point. And uh, that's going to land in the, uh, the set one dimension lower. So for every type, you have to actually verify that this action is a functor. And it's only going to be a functor up to the partial equivalence relation. So what I mean is that if, uh, if you do this twice, or if you just uh, do it once for a composite, the, the two results might not be syntactically identical, but they have to be related in the appropriate partial equivalence relation. So therefore, if you, um, if you quotient every level, then you'll get an actual cubicle set. Uh, there's one more complication, which is that um, the types themselves can actually depend on dimensions. So going back to the example of, uh, of univalence, if you have a type that's a path between a times b and b times a, then if you have an element of this type, which is like an element of a path over, if you're familiar with that concept from hot, um, then if you take the left endpoint of something in this type, you better get something that's an element of a times b. But if you take the right endpoint, you better get something that's an element of b times a. 
And these are totally different. So uh, types aren't exactly cubicle sets. They're what I would maybe call dependent cubicle sets. So it matters not only what dimension you go to, but how you got there. So uh, these are, if you write C for the cube category uh, that I'm using, then it's C sliced over, in this case, the, the object X um, and pre-sheaves over that. By the way, if anyone has a better name for dependent cubicle sets, uh, please tell me afterwards. Um, so you can define a cubicle type system and it's very similar to the definition of a cubicle type or of a type system from before. It's a functional symmetric transitive pervalued. Uh, the only addition is that everything is indexed also by dimension contexts, and you demand that the collection of types uh, forms a cubicle set. By which I mean um, the the action of substitution followed by evaluation has to be functorial. All right. So then you have to define at every dimension. Well, what does it mean? Aha. Good idea. So uh, uh, Jonas suggests relative cubicle set. Um, so you, you have to explain for, uh, for closed terms at some dimension context psi, what does it uh, mean to be equal types and what does it mean to be equal elements of a type? So you might be tempted to just say, well, do the same thing as before, except everything has an extra dimension context lying around. So uh, A equals B type when, if you evaluate both of those, you get something in the partial equivalence relation of types. But this isn't quite right, because that ensures that the uh, type relation, uh, the type judgment is closed under evaluation, but it's not going to be closed under dimension substitution. And uh, this is just because there's, there's no reason that if you take some term, and you, uh, you apply some dimension substitution to it, well, those instances could evaluate in all sorts of ways, and there's uh, no guarantee that, they, that they're coherent at all. So we have to add the additional requirement that uh, for something to be an element of a type or to be a type, every instance of it, every dimension instance, has to evaluate to an element of the appropriate partial equivalence relation, and um, these elements all have to be uh, coherent so that if you substitute twice, it's the same as substituting once. Okay, so uh, just to spell that out explicitly, you say that um, something is a type if for any sequence of two dimension substitutions, if you substitute and evaluate, then uh, substituting twice and evaluating or substituting and evaluating, then substituting or evaluating have to agree up to the partial equivalence relation and you do the same thing for the uh, element relation. And then the open judgments are actually very similar to the open judgments from before because coherence was already handled by the closed judgments. The only thing you have to add is that uh, to be a map from some cubicle set to another cubicle set, uh, you, don't, you can't just be a map at this level, but for any um, substitution into some other level, you have to be a map at that level too. Okay, now, uh, I'm just going to flash a bunch of rules up on the screen uh, to bewilder you, but uh, many um, familiar principles from type theory are going to hold uniformly in every dimension. So this is uh, how pi types work. This is exactly the same as the normal uh, rules for pi types. The only difference is that you write uh, psi everywhere. So that you have lambdas at every dimension, not just at the bottom dimension. Uh, path types work like this. They're dimension shift. So um, whenever you have an n plus one element, uh, n plus one dimensional element of A, then if you abstract this, uh, this brackets X is like a uh, dimension abstraction or a dimension lambda, then you get a uh, n dimensional element of the path space. Okay. If you have a um, uh, element of the path space, you can apply it to any dimension expression R to, uh, to get some uh, element of A back out. Uh, if you have an abstraction and you apply something to it, then you just have the normal uh, beta uh, reduction here. And if you consider the left or the right endpoints of, uh, of this path, they have to be the thing specified in the type. So uh, if you have a path from P0 to P1, if you look at the left endpoint, it has to be P0, of course. 
You can also define exact equality types satisfying equality reflection. This is essentially just because in cubicle sets you can define what is equality of, uh, of uh, two elements of a cubicle set and uh, that will satisfy equality reflection. So maybe this is surprising, but it's sort of not uh, semantically, it's, it's uh, completely unproblematic. Finally, uh, how does univalence work? Well, uh, Dan observed on the mailing list some time ago that, well, the, the full univalence axiom is kind of complicated. It's a statement about equivalence and uh, a certain mapping and equivalence, but uh, you can actually prove it under some very general assumptions, provided you have two things. First of all, you have a map from equivalences to paths between those types, and you have to know that if you transport across that path, then up to a path that's the same as applying the uh, function underlying the equivalence. So this, um, uh, we basically throw this in directly. So we say that if you have a type A and it's equivalent to uh, some type B0, and then there's a path from B0 to B1, that you get a uh, type whose left endpoint is A and whose right endpoint is B1. So this is saying you can compose a uh, path in the universe with an equivalence on the left. And uh, that will give you the, the first part, this uh, map from equivalences to paths. And then elements of this type are an element of A and an element of B. And uh, uh, you have to know that if you apply the function to the element of A, you get exactly the left uh, endpoint of the element of B. Uh, so if you're familiar with the glue types from CCHM, this is, uh, this is a very specific instance of, of that general construction. So speaking of transport, I still have to explain and the, the most complicated uh, part of the whole thing, which is uh, the con operations, because I haven't said anything yet that, uh, that assures vibrancy. All the cubicle infrastructure just makes sure that you have a good notion of paths. And uh, it says nothing about the fact that paths should be composable. So, you uh, equip types with two con operations. One is called coercion, and this is a generalization of transport. And the other is homogeneous con composition, which is a generalization of a box filling property. So what's really important is that uh, the, both of these are structures, they're not properties. And these structures have to be stable under dimension substitution. And this is uh, what is called uniformity in the, uh, in the name uniform con operation. All right, so uh, once we uh, define the con operations, then we can actually have multiple hierarchies of universes. We have universes for all the uh, pretypes or cubicle sets, and we have universes for all the con types or basically fibrant cubicle sets. So the way the coercion works is Suppose you have uh, some line in the universe and you have an element of uh, one side of it, then you can get an element of another side of it. So uh, if uh, you have a, a line A and you have an element of A0, you can get an element of A1 by coercing from the zero side to the one side of A. And you can also coerce from the zero side to the X side. So this will give you a full element of the type A and uh, this will actually be a path from, uh, from M to, um, to the coercion from zero to one. Regarding box filling, yeah, it's, it's I, th I think it's the same, except that uh, you know, this is a dependent cubicle set, or let's say relative cubicle set. So you're actually doing something from uh, by, you know, you're, you're actually changing the type when you go from the left to the right, for example. Um, hopefully that helps. Okay, so in order for this, uh, this type to be a, or in order for CoE0 to X to actually be a line from M to CoE0 to 1, we have to know that if you coerce from R to itself, that is you don't move anywhere, then that's exactly the identity function. And this has to be the identity function on the nose, not just up to a path or anything like that. Uh, from this, you can directly define transport in a type family, like uh, what's in Book Hot. So if you have a family of types and a path in the uh, domain and an element of, uh, uh, of the family 
at the left endpoint, then if you just apply the, the family B to the entire path P and you coerce from the left to the right, you go from B uh, of P0 to B of P1. So the, the final ingredient is homogeneous con composition. And this is called homogeneous because unlike in coercion where the only thing that's happening is that the type changes, here the type is not changing, but um, you're uh, sort of composing with, uh, with a bunch of other faces. So uh, the prototypical example is you have three sides of a square and the fourth side has to exist. Uh, so uh, if you're composing from zero to one, then on the y equals zero side, you have uh, this m. At the x equals zero side, you have this n zero. At the x equals one side, you have this n one. And then the result has to be uh, something at y equals one. And uh, it has to, and all of the input data has to agree uh, wherever uh, wherever there's overlap, and the output has to agree with the input wherever there's overlap. Uh, the, the square, three sides of a square is uh, the simplest example, but at higher dimensions, you don't actually have to provide like five sides of a cube or something like that. You can provide only three sides of a cube if you want, and the reason for this is uh, basically to be closed under a substitution, you have to allow for these or partial shapes that are obtained by taking uh, total shapes at some uh, lower dimension and degenerating. Uh, so for example, if you have the top left and right of this cube, then you can get the bottom of this cube. And uh, the other surprising thing is that you can attach along diagonal maps. So you can attach along you know, x equals zero and x equals one, that's the, uh, the blue and the green. You can also attach along x equals z so this is attaching a face along this diagonal. This is the, the uh, gray face here. And, um, and again, everything has to agree. Uh, and then the, the output, if you're coercing to one, if you look at the bottom, now you don't only fix the left and the right um, faces of the square at the bottom, you're also fixing the diagonal of the bottom. And this is uh, very crucial when it comes to um, implementing some of the con operations I'll get to momentarily. It's also very important that you can coerce, uh, you can compose to and from diagonals. Uh, so, you know, not just going from zero to one or one to zero, but also from zero to Z. And uh, this is the only way that we can define fillers from composition. So suppose that you have the M0, M, N0, and N1 uh, like before, and you want to define not just the, the bottom of this, uh, of this square, but the entire interior of the square as well. Well, you take the uh, the three paths and you degenerate them going, you know, into the screen in the z direction, pictured like this, and then you compose from the top to the diagonal of the cube. So, given the top left and right faces, I can get this diagonal of of the uh, entire filler. Uh, pictured again in gray, and if you uh, look at what the faces of this uh, of this uh, gray square are, the top is going to be M because M was just degenerated in that that direction. The left is going to be the diagonal of the degenerated N zero, which is just N zero, and same for the right. So you actually get um, exactly the filler um, using this sort of diagonal uh, composition. Um, but again, this only works if composition from R to R is exactly the identity. Otherwise, the, uh, the top edge would not be exactly M and you wouldn't get the filler. So you have to define the, uh, these con operations in such a way that every type is closed under these, uh, uh, these operations. So you say, well, how do I compose that uh, pi type? Well, I can compose at a pi type as long as I know how to compose uh, in every uh, in uh, every b. Right? I can coerce in uh, in a pi type as long as I know how to coerce in every b and also in a and and so on. And notice here, for example, I have to check that uh, if 
that the way that I've defined composition in the pi type, if I coerce from R to R, this has to be exactly the same as um, M. And it will be because uh, it's implemented using an HCOM R to R prime in B, which if R equals R prime will be exactly uh, the cap M applied to A. And then lambda A M A is exactly the same as M by eta expansion. Okay, so you don't have to read all these, but the idea is that you, you implement uh, uh, HCOM and CoE at every type by uh, going to the uh, smaller types. And then finally, you uh, have to equip higher inductive types and the universe with a free con composition structure because otherwise they just won't be con. So when I was talking about the, uh, the circle before, I said you have the base and you have loop, uh, and you also have to have uh, composites and inverses and so forth. And uh, to do that, you just say, uh, the circle is the least thing that has the base and loop and also the, the minimum con composition structure. And the universe similarly just is not going to have composition unless you put it in there. Uh, and uh, when you put it in there, if you want the, um, if you want all the elements of the universe, uh, yes. Well, I'll get, uh, I'll get to that. Um, so if you, uh, right, so you, um, you say, okay, if I have three lines in the universe, then there has to be a composite of these three lines in the universe. And that has to be in the universe. So it has to be a type because everything in the universe has to be a type. If it's a type, that means I have to know what its elements are. So I have to explain what its elements are. Uh, in the case of the picture I've drawn here, the elements of uh, this composite, which is the, the bottom face of this uh, square on the right, the elements are going to be an element of A, an element of B0 with one for Y, and an element of B1 with one for Y, such that if you coerce from one to zero along B0 and B1, you get exactly the, uh, the endpoints of M. Uh, and the, the hardest part about this whole thing is that not only does this uh, thing on the right have to be a type, but it also has to be con because you want the entire, um, you want the universe to not only consist of types, but consist of con types. So you have to define the, um, uh, the con operations for the composites in the universe. And this is exactly where the diagonal cofibrations or attaching faces you know, along diagonals is uh, completely essential because suppose that you're doing some sort of uh, composition from R to R prime in a composition from S to S prime in the universe. Well, you have to know that if S equals S prime, then the type you're composing in should be exactly A. So this should be the same as composition in A. But if R equals R prime, you should know that this entire composition should be the same as M. So you have to ensure both of these things, something when S equals S prime and something when R equals R prime, and both of these could be diagonals. So the outline of, uh, of the way that this works is you say this is a composition from S to S prime and you attach a face along R to R prime. All right. Given all of this uh, structure, you can define a weak notion of uh, J uh, for the path type, by which I mean, uh, of, of course, you have raffle and you'll have a, a J, but on raffle, it's only going to be uh, uh, the same as the input data up to a path. Uh, separately, you can just define an indexed higher inductive type that's generated by a raffle constructor, like the you know, normal identity type, and this will satisfy J on the nose. Um, this is work done by uh, my colleague Evan, as well as Bob. There's a preprint you can look at. Um, but the path type and the identity type are not going to be the same. Uh, you can have both of them and it's nice to have the identity type because that means you can model all of the rules from Bookhot. So just to wrap up, uh, what I've described is a cubicle type theory that's based on a Cartesian notion of cube as opposed to a De Morgan notion of cube like in CCHM. And all of the terms are 
uh, can be interpreted as programs, and you uh, have canonicity because there's a because all the terms are programs. So whenever you have an element of bool, it evaluates to either true or false. So this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it shows that Cartesian cubes suffice. Uh, De Morgan cubes are a lot more complicated. I don't really know if one is better than the other, but um, starting out, everyone was kind of trying to make Cartesian cubes work because it seemed like sort of the obvious thing. And, uh, and there were some technical difficulties related to the lack of these diagonal co-fibrations. Um, and uh, so it's nice to see that uh, Cartesian cubes suffice. And they seem to be sort of the simplest notion of cube on which you could build a, a cubical type theory. Okay. Uh, because of the um, identity type that I just described, you can model all of Bokhat uh, in this theory. So uh, that means that whenever you have a term in Bokhat, you can interpret it into this theory and then it run it as a program and you'll get, you know, a Boolean, you'll, uh, you'll get either true or false. Um, of course, just because M evaluates to true in this model doesn't mean that M is equal to true in Bokhat. In fact, that's not the case. So, uh, so there's some question about, can we uh, take the computation here and somehow bring it back up to, uh, uh, to hot? And uh, I'm not sure about that. And uh, finally, this is a two-level type theory in the sense that we have both paths and exact equality, like in HTS. And uh, as just as a side note, one thing that's cool is that uh, some equality types are actually fibrant, um, unlike in HTS, where none of the equality types are fibrant. And I can talk about that in the questions, maybe if anyone's interested. So because all of this is done on syntax, it's immediately suitable for implementation. And you can just uh, prove things and run the proofs just straight away. There are actually two implementations of, uh, of related theories in progress. There's the Red Pearl Proof Assistant uh, that uh, uh, John Sterling is really spearheading, but you know, Favonia and I and Evan and others are, are um, contributing to. And uh, you can go to the website. There are proofs of uh, full univalence, uh, proof of J, proof of groupoid laws, uh, some other things. And there's also a definition of semi-simplicial types, uh, thanks to Favonia, which we can do because uh, we have exact equality types. There's also a, um, a prototype YAKTT uh, type checker that Anders and I are working on. Uh, that stands for yet another Cartesian cubicle type theory. Um, and it's basically uh, trying to answer the question, what if we take the cubicle TT implementation and we just kind of rip out all the parts that have to do with uh, De Morgan and, and stuff and uh, replace them with uh, what I explained today? And uh, is it going to work better? Um, this is uh, very much work in progress and uh, we hope to find the answer. All right, so uh, if you want to read more about all the things I talked about, you can uh, go to my website. There's a nice uh, preprint uh, the, the first thing listed here that uh, has some exposition about, uh, about everything I described today. Um, there is a uh, paper on the archive that has every single technical detail, but that's probably not what you want to look at. And uh, finally, um, there's a very nice uh, paper on GitHub by basically everybody um, about Cartesian cubicle type theory sort of a bit more generally. And, uh, um, this, this has a very nice history of sort of the various uh, con conditions that everyone considered and, uh, and um, also some uh, sort of semantics, um, uh, more traditional sort of uh, topos theoretic semantics work, uh, if you're interested in that. Anyway, so uh, that's all. All right. Um, so now I'm going to unmute everyone's microphone so that we can thank Carlo and then we'll move to the discussion session. So here we go. All right, so I think everyone should be back to uh, muted now. So we'll start the discussion session. I want to point out one thing that uh, we are recording. So if you want to ask a question, this may become a part of recording and with Carlos permission, we're going to post it. So keep that in mind when asking a question. 
Um, so if you if you want to ask a question, just unmute your microphone and uh, go for it. Uh, so um, when you started out, you talked about the uh, about uh, the, the non cubicle model, like for um, the Perl, and um, in that um, you know you pointed out that you can it does validate these extensional principles, but you can choose not to have them. Um, so then when you move to the cubicle world, it would sort of the moral equivalent of that be the, the, the two levelness and, and so forth that you have these extra two level exact things um, that are somehow similar to the extensional things because there are these other principles you get from the model or is there something else or does that analogy not work at all? Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's exactly right, or th that's at least part of it. And that, yeah, if you if you didn't want, so you know, because we have uh, equality reflection and so forth, the the judgments are. If you include that, the judgments are certainly not decidable. If if you want them to be, you can just uh, drop that, or maybe instead of having equality reflection, have some sort of uh, proof relevant terms for reasoning about the equality. You know, like some. Uh, some other uh, approaches to two-level type theory have been doing recently. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's one thing that's validated in the model that you may or may not want to actually have. Other things that are validated in the in the model are uh, you know similar principles like all maps out of void are the same uh, judgmentally, and uh, you can do untyped reduction of terms and things like that. So all of these you may want or not want. And so in Red Pearl we have most of these principles. And in YAKTT, we don't, um, because it's intended to be much closer to the sort of CCHM uh, version. So. Um, so a related question on that is, I, I noticed you, you were talking about that, that you uh, in Red Pearl validate J. Um, right, and now I remember, I seem to remember that in the CCHM type stuff, you didn't have J on the nose, right? Uh, you had, uh, you could, so you had to change your ID type a bit or something to get it. So um, does that, so that validation of J, does that come via introducing these other principles or does that just come by using this nicer formulation of uh, box filling and com stuff? Uh, sorry, I was fiddling around and I missed the very beginning of what you're saying. So, so you, yeah, there are two different um, sort of identity types, so to speak. One of them is defined by this level shift in the cubicle sets. And the other one is uh, defined as inductively generated by Ruffle. Uh, so for both of them, you have some form of J. For, uh, for the one uh, generated by Ruffle, uh, the natural elimination principle is exactly J. So you get that on the nose. Um, but what, what was the beginning of the question? So that, that sort of answers it. So the validation of J that you don't get in CCHM, you don't get in the same way here as long as you only look at the uh, the, at, at the same subset, and it's only when you move to the extensional principles that you get the on the nose jet. Uh, well, it's not an extensional principle. It's just it's basically a specific higher inductive type. Um, okay. So yeah. So similarly with CCHM, the the level shift path type does not have J on the nose. Um, that's true of both theories. Um, but also in both theories, you can define a different type that does have J on the nose. Um, and it's going to be equivalent to the path type. It's not, it's not the same. And actually, uh, nobody knows how to make it the same. And uh, maybe somebody, I don't know. That's, this is uh, one of the big open questions in cubicle type theory is, like, could you possibly make them the same? That answers the question. Thanks. Okay. Hello? OK. Uh, <clears throat> So when, when you uh, showed the last slide, uh, I, I actually was I was going to give a comment on which is maybe answered by this, but let me say anyway, um, because I thought there were two two topics in your presentation. On, on the one hand, uh, there was this uh, realizability stuff, uh, and on the other hand, there were some new ideas about this uh, uh, cubicle and Cartesian cubicle theory, uh, which I found very very interesting. So I think it's, it's good to, to separate uh, these two things. Um, and, 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 and maybe one remark, uh, because you said earlier, you give a semantics, and it wasn't really clear semantics of what exactly. And, and in the very end, you say, uh, and now we have a type theory. So, so how is the step from the semantics 
which was a tax theory. Uh, yeah, well, so, 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 I mean, if you're implementing this, so uh, whether you're doing Red Pearl or Yak TT or something else, if you want to use this on a computer, you have to fix some set of principles. And, uh, and this, this stuff that I presented today should be a model for that set of principles. Uh, so you can, there are sort of two points of view. You could say that the model is a notion of type theory. Um, and in, I think that, but at the same time, I also think if you want to mean some set of rules by type theory, then okay, then this is a type theoretic model of a type theory in that sense. So uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't explain what exactly are the set of rules. And in fact, in the two implementations, the set of rules are actually rather different, uh, like I was uh, saying with uh, Gershom. Um, and yeah, I agree that there, there are two different subjects uh, here, but uh, somehow I, I feel like if you, um, you need some sort of uh, logical relation semantics in order to uh, be sure that the thing that you defined is nice. So, um, you know, so I, if you just write down some set of rules, then it's, uh, you know, well, you could just use hot if you just want any set of rules. And what I want is a set of rules that satisfies canonicity. So I really want to look not only at some set of rules, but at, at the model. Yes, uh, just like, come on. So for me, uh, it makes sense. So once you uh, in investigate the sort of computational structure of your system, then that's also related to what I did in my PhD. Then obviously you want to sort of realizability semantics. You want to talk about computation. Right? But uh, to me, I mean, maybe in traditional logics, there's, there's, there's a difference between the system, the syntax and the rules and the semantics, you know? And mm -hmm. only when you make this difference, you can ask questions like soundness and completeness, yeah? I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's sufficient just to represent the semantics and say, this is the system. I mean, that, that sort of, there's, there's something missing uh, for me, right? I, I don't know whether you wanted to do this, but I'm just... Um, well. Yeah, I mean, you, you prove soundness for, like, the rules that I flashed up on the screen or the rules in Red Pearl or, or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree if it was just, if you just say, I've defined some relation of some sort and I don't check anything about it, well, okay, I've defined something, but I don't know that it makes, that it has anything to do with, you know, the, the theory that I have in mind. So, you, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, I think. Can I ask something? Is it is this exchange over? Uh, it looks like it. <laughs> um, can I just ask something about the two-level type theory again? Um, so as an example, if you have uh, in your model uh, something being strictly isomorphic, strictly in the sense of the strict identity, to a fibrin type, is it fibrin? Um, no, because the, um, because being fibrant means that there is a, that you have a constructor equipped on that type and you, you can have, you can have two cubicle sets that are, that are strictly isomorphic, but you equipped one of them with a constructor and you didn't equip the other one with a constructor. Yeah, but can you, can you not then transfer it? Yes, but but uh, in the definition of being of being con here is like the H com at that type does the right thing. So if that isn't defined, then uh, even if it's isomorphic to something where it is defined, or even if it could be defined, you know, it's uh, if it's not there, it it's not vibrant. So so that that is one. I, my understanding is that so that's one axiom that is a plausible axiom to consider in other definitions of two-level type theory that your model takes uh, refutes, right? That is not consistent with my model. Well, you can, yeah, I mean, as you're saying, you can transfer, like, 
you could say if this thing is vibrant, then the other thing is vibrant. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a matter of do do you actually know how to compute, you know, H com B, uh, given that you have H com A and the fact that A, you know, is isomorphic to B. So you need some way of knowing in the computation system that that uh, you know how to how to do H com B. Any other questions or comments? I mean, I can start asking questions, but uh, <laughs> I'll see if is, is, it, is it a, a, a quiz on the talk? Or, um. uh, no, I mean, I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. So let's have some questions from Carlo. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, um, So the, the two-level type theory that I presented, so, okay, if you just look at the fibrin fragment, you get a model of hot. If you look at the entire two-level thing, then you almost get a model of HTS, and there are a couple differences. In one is uh, we, we uh, get to show that some exact equality types are fibrin. That's a plus. Um, but uh, two things that we don't have are, first of all, the resizing rules. And second of all, that the universe of non-fibrin things is fibrin. In HTS, uh, that's one of the rules, that the, the universe of pretypes is uh, con-type. And uh, that's not true here. And I'm wondering if anyone has any um, insight on that, or like why it's true in the simplicial set model, or, or why it might not be true here, or anything like that. What do you think so, Jonas? I have a comment. Oh, yeah. Well, in, in the CCHM model, it's certainly the case that the, the, the um, universe of pretypes at any level uh, isn't just can it's a contractible type actually it's a weird fact but it's true so there's, there's a path from from any type to to the empty type hmm. i would have thought that would have been true in in your cartesian uh, uh, model as well in fact since, since the fact that it's true is true for quite general reasons. Basically, if you, if you have a type X, you know, a pre-type X, and you raise it to the power uh, I equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I is zero, that's X to the one, which is in bijection with X. And when I is one, uh, that's, X to the empty set, which is in bijection with a one element set. And you can strictify those bijections and get an actual path from X to one. And X was anything, so it might be, for example, the empty type. Um, mm. And that's a pretty, pretty general uh, thing, which I think probably would be true in your model as well. So that's the interesting. Three types is a very strange, trivial kind of thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, is, is it possible that it's not true here because these universes are uh, defined inductive recursively? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you do your universes that way. So, so I, I don't, I don't know either way. Um, uh, what would be true for yours? Um, but I just suspect that the argument I just gave, which is so sort of doesn't depend on very much, would probably work uh, for you just as well as it does for CCHM. Hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. And that somehow 
the the issue that you run into uh, in uh, what I'm doing is that if you if you define the uh, types if you define these uh, composites of types in the way that I uh, that I explained and you want um, you want everything in the con universe to be in the pre universe then you have to stick these uh, you have to uh, also have uh, sort of free compositions of pre types but if you're composing a bunch of things that are only pre-types, then the definition I gave isn't even coherent um, if you don't know that the things you're composing are vibrant. Um, so there might be some, yeah, there might be some totally different way of uh, proving that it's vibrant or equipping it with a, with a constructor. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll have to think about that. So another question that I have uh, is uh, that, uh, like I said, uh, because this is a model for hot, you can uh, take some proof in hot and interpret it here and run it. But what you get is not going to be judgmentally equal in hot to the thing uh, that you started with, obviously, because hot doesn't have canonicity and this does. Um, but in fact, it's extremely non-obvious that what that uh, what you get is even homotopic to the thing that you started with and you know if you could show that then uh, this would be a way of proving homotopy canonicity um, and I have no idea how to do that uh, because this model is quite a bit stricter than uh, than sort of what the syntax of hot provides and even CCHM you know has a lot of equations that, that uh, hot does not provide um, so I wonder if there's some sort of way that you could use syntactic models like this to, uh, uh, to somehow uh, pull things, pull equalities here all the way back into paths in Bocat. Um, that'd be great. I, I have no idea how to do it. So I, I have a related question that is completely off the wall, but um, I, I assume you were at uh, Emily's talk and know about the uh, real Shulman stuff. And so mm -hmm. I, I hadn't realized how far this had gotten. That, obviously, that's what the discussion is focusing on is the, the two levelness of this. Is, is, do you think that a similar approach, perhaps generalized in different ways, could be used uh, to give something uh, a type of model uh, for the real Shulman stuff? Uh, yes, I, I do think so. Probably. I mean, I, I don't want to, <laughs> that's, a, that's a complicated question, but I think uh, in principle, yes, because they already have some sort of cubicle structure going on, and, uh, and they use uh, book hot as sort of the, the innermost level in order to talk about, you know, just uh, spaces. Uh, they just use types from book hot as their notion of space. So you should be able to replace that notion of space with some cubicle type theory notion of space. And in fact, they already have cubes lying around. And if you did that, you, you at least would get canonicity for that fragment. And I wonder whether you could also handle all of the uh, sort of shape uh, things that they, that they also add to the theory. Um, so I'm not totally sure about that, but I think you could certainly sort of do the cubicle type theory version of that and, uh, and uh, at least improve uh, matters with regard to computation. All right, do we have any more questions or answers to questions? Oh, yeah, not me. I, I'm always good for... <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I, I would say, I'm not sure I understood this right, but I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, first of all, did I understand right? You start with the path type, which in my mind is sort of the right thing, because it reflects the, the internal sort of uh, equality. But then you say, if you, then you can define the identity type uh, as a hit, the uh, reference is the only constructor, yeah? So I thought this is very nice, it's a very nice way, I mean, to, uh, to relate uh, these two things, right? Um, and I'm not so sure about this, uh, um, whether it's such a, I mean, the question whether the two can be uh, identified, 
What does this question actually mean? I mean, well, okay. So it basically means, can you define the con operations in such a way where the path type satisfies J strictly? Um, you wouldn't necessarily expect this to hold. I mean, in like for us, it doesn't hold and for CCHM, it doesn't hold, but um, you could imagine a world in which it did hold. Uh, we just don't know how to do it. In particular, it always breaks at the universe. Um, you can't implement um, coercion in the universe or in com compositions of types in the universe. You can't implement that in such a way uh, that's strict enough that it gives you uh, J strictly. So as things so as stand they, now, now, we have like yeah, two different types. Do. One of them has J strictly, one of them has J weakly, but uh, you know, ideally maybe you could just use the path type, which I agree is more natural in this setting. And you know, the more strict principles that hold about that, the better. Mm. I, I don't know whether it's relevant, but uh, we did something like this for OTT, if you look in our OTT paper, that we had a way to uh, basically, I mean, recover uh, the, the strict rule, the strict beta uh, for J. Right? Mm. Yeah. And also, there's this, uh, I, um, yeah, so Nikolai gave a talk at the last types about this question. Um, this is answered by what you said, actually, because the question was uh, whether, um, um, what's the question exactly? Whether, whether if you start with a, with a weak, uh, with a weak, uh, I mean the fast type, with a weak uh, a J, whether uh, this, having this, no, it's the same question, right? Whether the strict J is uh, conservative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But well, for another theory, so. Yes, but, but I mean, okay. Do you see what I mean? I mean, this, this, uh, this is sort of related to this uh, conservativity reserved by Martin Hoffman, which basically says that tangential type theory is in a way uh, conservative over intangible type theory uh, with, uh, uh, with extensionality and, uh, 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 and universe of identity proofs. You know? uh, and now, a similar question you could ask is, uh, uh, can you substrictify this equality? I, I think this is closely related to your question. So I mean, we wonder actually whether there's a way to use uh, Martin Hoffman's construction to, to, uh, to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. As, as it stands right now, uh, you know, this, this identity type is not it's not something that you can just define internally as some improvement of the path type or something. It really is a totally different type. Um, it's just nice to know that you, that you can have both. And it's equivalent. Yeah, yeah of course, right. Actually, uh, sure. Yes. Okay, it seems that that's going to be the last question. So I would like to remind everyone about the mailing list that you can join and about the Google Calendar that you can join and have things in your Google Calendar so that you don't miss the next Hottest. Um, on that note, let me once again unmute everyone's microphone so that we can thank Carlo again. And on that note, that was it for today. And we'll resume next week. Uh, sorry, in two weeks from now with Ulrich's talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks.